Good evening. What a blessing it is to be here this evening as we've gathered again once more as God's children, as the saints, as those who gather on the first day of the week to worship and praise His glorious and holy name. What an awesome opportunity we have each and every week to gather together in encouragement, right? To be able to be with one another as we uplift each other. Let me tell you, encouragement is a beautiful thing, is it not? When we think about encouragement, maybe there's been times in your life where somebody has encouraged you to keep pressing on. Maybe you've gone through some hardship at some point in your life that, man, there was somebody in the church, whether it was a, a, an actual, you know, a, uh, an immediate family member or a member of the Lord's body, a spiritual family member who encouraged you to just keep pressing on, right? You think about Paul's letter to the Philippians. What a book of encouragement. I can think of times in my life where I've been encouraged. I, I have a passage in my Bible marked uh, specifically with a note from a good sister, an elder's wife, that wrote me a, an encouragement letter years ago uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. And the letter that she wrote, it's a little short, little sticky note that she put there. Uh, this was given to me by, by uh, Linda Holder. She said, we love you both, talking to me and Kelsey. She said, you are made for greatness. It's real. That was so encouraging, especially during some hard times that I was experiencing and the encouragement that she offered during that time. Her husband as well, and many others in the body of Christ. We need encouragement, do we not? We need to be a people of encouragement. And the purpose of the book that we've been going through in the book of Jude is a letter of encouragement. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about false teachers, right? And we think about lessons like that. We're like, how is that encouraging? It's discouraging to hear about false teachers. But let me tell you something. What Jude is encouraging them to do is despite false doctrine, despite those who may be false messengers, despite those who try to divide the church, you and I ought to keep pressing on. Amen? Regardless. And that's encouraging. To know that regardless, if we keep pressing on, just as the way Jesus told the early church in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, what did he say? Be faithful unto death and I will do what? I'm going to give you a crown of life. That's encouragement. And in the next section that we're going to be looking at in Jude 17 through 23, we're going to see how Jude encourages the church. How he encouraged them, despite the false teaching that was going on, how he encouraged them to keep pressing on, to not be given into those things, but rather to keep upholding the truth. Because if there's anything that we need to be encouraged more so than anything else in our life, it's to stick to Jesus Christ, to keep holding on to the pattern, to keep teaching and loving souls. Let's go ahead and look at this passage if you have your Bibles. I want us to look at Jude. We're going to begin reading in verse 17. As we look at our first point, the first thing that Jude wants him to take note in Jude uh, 17 through 18 is he's encouraging the beloved. The, uh, this word beloved appears several times within this context that we're going to be reading. And the reason why is because, and throughout this entire book so far, he's mentioned the word beloved several other times. And the reason why is because Drew, Jude, excuse me, not Drew, Drew loves you, but Jude, Jude loves his brethren deeply. He calls them beloved because they're beloved by God. The word beloved there means sanctified. It means a saint. It means one whom God loves, one who has God's Holy Spirit, one who truly is a follower of Jesus. But it also denotes a family sense, right? It denotes, I love you and Jude loved them. And that's the reason why he's encouraging them. So let's go ahead and begin reading as he encourages them first and foremost to remember the word of God. Let's go ahead and look in verse 17 through 18 if you have your Bibles. It says this, it says, but you must be, excuse me, you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles. Now, I want us to stop there for a second. The predictions of the apostles, what is he talking about here? It says the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the inspired, written things that the apostles had written. Uh, for example, you know, Peter said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, when he was on the Sanhedrin, when he, or excuse me, when he was on trial before the Sanhedrin, he said, we cannot speak about the things in which, he says, we can't remain silent about the things in which we've both seen and which we've heard. Peter would also say in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, he would say, say, if anyone speaks, let him do what? He says, let him speak as the oracles of God. So if anyone, he says, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the greatness which God supplies. See, here's the thing. The apostles, they didn't speak on their own accord. They didn't say, okay, well, here's what Jesus says, but here's what I think. They said the truth. Remember what Jesus told them to go do? Remember Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. What did Jesus say to them? It says, go therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things which I have commanded you. And that's what they did. They went forth proclaiming the message of Christ. 
They went forth teaching the words from God. They didn't say, okay, well, this is what Jesus says, but this is what Peter has to say. They didn't say, here's what the Messiah says, but here's what the Apostle Paul has to say. No, they went forth everywhere preaching what they were instructed to teach. He's saying, don't lose sight of that. That message you've been taught. Because remember earlier last week, we talked about what these false teachers were doing. He's saying, you want to know how you're going to be able to decipher that? By keeping close to what you've been taught. Multiple times in the scripture, I could think back to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 through 17, Jeremiah told about, now God through Jeremiah the prophet told the, the, uh, the Israel, excuse me, the kingdom of Judah under the uh, old law. He said, stick to the old paths. Go back to those ancient paths. In other words, go back to the source. And this is what Judah is telling the Christians. He's encouraging them, go back to the very foundation of your faith. That's Jesus Christ, amen? And the foundation of the faith is the word of God. Who Jesus is. So we look at this, what he's saying here. He says, but you remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, because this is the true path. Remember what Jesus himself said in John chapter 14 and verse 6. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You think the apostles were teaching anything different than that? Absolutely not. Jesus says, I'm the only way. What do you think Peter was preaching? Jesus is the only way. You remember when, and even though he wasn't an apostle, he was a disciple of the early church, but he was taught by the apostles. You remember Philip when he's teaching the Ethiopian eunuch. You know what it says there in Acts chapter 8? It says when he sat in that chariot with him, what did he preach? Did he preach opinion? Did he preach whatever came to his mind? No, it said he preached Jesus to him. Because that's the foundation of everything in which we believe. Jude here says, remember this. This idea of you must remember, that's imperative. That means it's important, right? That means we've got to stick to this. He says, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostle, uh, excuse me, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, to, the, to, the, uh, to, to his son of the faith, Timothy, Paul, an apostle, would say in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, he would go on to say, hold fast a pattern of sound words. Now, when we look at what he's about to say next, he says this. He says, this is what they said to you in verse 18. He says, they said to you that in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions, which is true. There were. Peter talks about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. Paul to Timothy in 2 Peter chapter 4, as well as in the book of Romans, would talk about those who would try to bring division. And I like this word that he uses, scoffer. Some translations use mockers, right? Those who mock the Lord. Here's the thing. People weren't just mocking the Lord after his death. They were mocking him during his earthly ministry, right? You remember that young girl who was dead. And Jesus says, she's only sleeping. What did they do when he said that? They laughed at him. Jesus would go forth and he would proclaim, he would proclaim, you know, the resurrection and whatnot. And the Sadducees, it says in the scriptures, the Sadducees mocked him. You remember when he was on the cross, people that mocked him. And his disciples, even after he ascended to heaven, they were still mocked because there are those who will not stand for truth, right? There are those who don't want the truth. There are those who won't want to hear the truth. And they're going to be those who mock. You know, that's what uh, the psalmist in Psalm 1 and verse 1 through 3 says. His blessed is the man who stands not in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer. The idea of sitting in the seat of the scoffer, scoffers are those who are content with the way the world is around them. They don't want to see anything different. And they mock everything else that's different. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 says to those who are foolish, he says, the gospel's foolish to them. He says, to those who reject the gospel, it's foolishness to those who will not believe. They mock it. They make fun of the gospel. And that's what these people were doing. They were making a mockery. These false teachers that Jude is addressing, they were making a mockery. And to those, the recipients of this letter that he's trying to encourage, he's saying, look, the apostles spoke of this. Jesus spoke of this. And he continues on. And he says, they said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. So think about what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, that their God is their belly. You know what that means? They only seek to satisfy their own needs. He says, he says that this is, he says, following their own ungodly passions. And in verse, as we look at this idea of what he's talking about here, you know, verse 19 is going to continue with a similar theme. But we've got to think, what caused the false teachers to seek and follow after their own godly passions? What caused that? 
the thing in which Peter, or excuse me, Jude, as well as Peter, because Jude and uh, uh, Second Peter are, are very have very similar messages. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of what Jude uh, is saying, many scholars believe that he is reiterating what Peter had already said in his letter. Now, the thing is, what Jude is encouraging them to do is what these false teachers had left. See, these false teachers left the Word of God, and Jude is encouraging those Christians that still remained to keep remaining, to keep holding to the truth, to keep loving the truth, to keep holding fast to the Word of God. I think of, you know, the reason why these false teachers sought and followed after their own godly passions, and it's because it's just like what Paul said in 2 Peter chapter, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, they would not endure sound doctrine. Jude is encouraging the readers of his letter to hold to the word no matter what may come, to not give up. Now, do we love the word of God with everything that we have? Let's ask ourselves that. Do we love the word of God with everything that we have? You know, Psalm 119, verse 72. I love what David there says. He says the word of God is more precious than, than he says, than silver. You know, in Psalm 119, verse 164, he says seven times a day I devote it to reading the word of God. You know why? Because earlier in the very beginning of Psalm 119, verse 9, as well as in verse 11, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to the word. He says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not what? I might not sin against you. David said, I don't want to drift. I don't want to fall away. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 119, and verse 67, David himself says, For when I was afflicted, I went astray. He says, the reason why I was punished at times was because I strayed away from your word. But he says, but now I love your law and I want to uphold it with everything I have. Do we have that same mindset as, as Christians? Do we love the word of God? This is what he's encouraging them to do. He's encouraging them to cling to the truth. He's encouraging them to cling to what the apostles reminded them of, to be focused on the word of God, as well as if you're going to be able to withstand false teaching, if you're going to be able to stand up against it, you're going to be one who knows the truth, right? You have to be one that knows the truth. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. How can I do that if I don't know the word of God? How can I do that if I don't study the word of God? How can I endure when false teaching tries to rear its ugly head in a congregation or, in, or, in, or in, uh, in works around the brotherhood, how can I endure if I don't know the truth? We love the word of God? Then let's hold to it. Let's cling to the word of God. This is a reminder that we've seen all throughout the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, I want to look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. I want to read several passages straight from the text itself. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul writing to his other, another individual who Paul regarded as a son of the faith. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Paul would say similar things to Timothy. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 1 through 3, this is what he says here. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, he says, Let all who are under a, a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. What he's saying here is those Christians who are under the yoke of a master, they were individuals who were bondservants. He says, look, do the best you can to make sure that everything you do does not contradict what the Word of God says, right? These are individuals that must uphold the Word of God even in their state. It's not just the role of preachers. It's not just the role of elders. It's not just the role of deacons. It's not just the role of Bible class teachers to uphold the truth, but every single Christian, no matter their status in life. You know, John would say similar things in 2 John 9, also in verse 10. See, Jude is reminding them and encouraging them to remember the Word. I want to look at our second point this evening as we look at what else Jude is reminding them of. In verse 19 through 20, he reminds them to remain in the holy faith and of the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and read that together, if you will. And it says this. It says, it is these. Now he's talking about those false teachers again. He says, it is these who cause division. How does God view division? You remember what Paul prayed for in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10? He says, I beseech you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all do what? that you all speak the same things and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together and in the same mind and in the same judgment. And yet there were those who strove for division. 
There were those who tried to cause division with false teaching. Paul called those type of individuals in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. He says their teaching is gangrene. What does gangrene do? It corrupts, right? What do you do when gangrene affects the body? You try to cut it off at where it began. You try to cut it off from spreading even further. It's because of them that division occurred. Because of their teaching, their message that was gangrene. You know, we think about this idea, uh, Paul would, would reiterate multiple times to Timothy the same thing. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, uh, to the church at Rome, Paul would reiterate to them, he would say to them, to be wary of those who bring division. To be wary of those who strive to cause division and strife within the body of Christ. Because the unifying factor, once again, we've got to cling to the Word of God. And we've got to all strive to be of that one faith that Paul preached about in Ephesians chapter 4, Right? We've got to strive to hold to that, to cling to that. And if we're going to do that, we're not going to allow for false doctrine to try to creep in. Here's the thing. Why does Jude talk heavily about this? Because false doctrine is what causes people to lose their salvation. Think about how many people have lost their souls because of believing and advocating and teaching false doctrine. If you don't believe that's the case, then the message of the New Testament uh, is you think about multiple times, how many times just within this book alone, and in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2 through 3, uh, you think about as well as Paul's letters uh, to Timothy, Paul's letters throughout the, and the book of Philippians as well, the constant reminder, the, book, the Hebrews writer, this constant reminder to stick to the truth. Why? What's the purpose in this constant reminder? What's the danger? Why is there urgency? Because the truth sets you free. But false doctrine puts you back in bondage. It enslaves you again. And the message that he's wanting his readers to understand, Jude, is, man, you've got to cling to the truth. But here's where they, they've decided to follow their own desires, their own passions. And he says, let's go ahead and read verse 19 again. He says, it is these who cause division, worldly people. These are individuals who are worldly minded. There are those who are living according to the flesh. They're not living according to the spirit. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12? He says, he says, for if you live according to the Spirit, he says, you shall live. But if by, he says, if, or excuse me, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death deeds of the body, you will do what? He says, you will live. Earlier on in that chapter, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul says that if you are in Christ, you've put the flesh away. It's dead. You don't live any longer in it. He says, therefore, we are debtors to the, uh, to, he says, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Now we think about what's being said here. He calls them worldly people. He says they're devoid of the Spirit. This word devoid means to be empty. This idea of being devoid of the Spirit, you know what that means? That means they've fallen away. These are people who at one point obeyed Jesus. We don't want to assume there are people who teach that, well, you know, they probably were never Christians to begin with. They probably never really, because you can't fall away. Well, no, that's not what we see in the New Testament at all. You remember Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, the church of Galatia, they were teaching false doctrine, were they not? And what does Paul say to them? Well, you were never Christians to begin with. No, that's not what he says. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, he says, you have been severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, here's the thing. When we look at what Jude is saying here, he's saying to them, he's saying that they're devoid of the Spirit. Here's the thing. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, what is, what is Peter there? When they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? How does Peter respond? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, right? And you shall do what? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul says that the Holy Spirit is that seal that shows that we are those who follow God. These people have allowed for themselves to be severed and thus have become devoid of the Spirit, thus having fallen away. These are people who have chosen to go after their own worldly passions, not godliness. Not living life in the Spirit. You know, Galatians chapter, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, gives a tremendous list of what it looks like to live in the Spirit. You know, the fruits of the Spirit, right? Earlier on, though, he talks about, here's what it looks like to live in the flesh. And it's like this complete stark contrast. You can see the difference between the two. He says, he says this, he says, as you lived, when we look at this passage, he says, these individuals are devoid of the spirit. But in verse 20, he says, but you beloved building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter eight, verse 26 and verse 27. Uh, see this encouragement to remain in the holy faith and in the Holy Spirit without faith. It's impossible to please God, right? 
Isn't that what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6? Building on faith is building on the foundation of Christ. That's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. See, if we're truly going to build up, then we're rather, if we're truly going to be building up and we're going to truly be building each other up, then we're going to keep in the word of the Lord. You remember what was said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58? It's one of my favorite passages, man. Paul there says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If we're striving to be those who are built up in the faith, we're going to be doing everything. Notice all throughout this, he keeps saying, this is what you need to be doing. God's already done his part. He's given you the blueprints. You need to be doing your part. You need, he's encouraging them to keep on doing something, and that's to keep staying with the Word, keep growing in the faith. He says, keep living in the Spirit. If you're praying in the Holy Spirit, you are engaged in a vital aspect of spiritual growth, church growth. And this means that you're an individual who is firmly implanted in his love and lifestyle. Once again, going back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, he gives those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, right? You can go down that list. He gives these lists that show this is an individual whose life is completely ingrained in the Spirit in accordance to his word, and that pours forth in your worship. It pours forth, including in prayer. These are individuals who their lives are saturated in the Word of God. Their lives are saturated in the life of the Spirit of God. These are people who are doing that. He's telling them, look, these other people, they've given that up. That's why they're devoid. He says, that's why they're empty. But you keep filling yourselves up with God and godliness. Keep living as those who have the Spirit of God in their life because you do. These people have given that up. Don't walk down that same path. I want to look at our, th our third and final point of what he says in this next section. He not only encourages them to remember the word, he not only encourages them to remain in the holy faith and holy spirit, but he also encourages them to be rooted in godliness. To be rooted in godliness. Go ahead and keep reading in verse 21 through 23. Verse 21 through 23, he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Notice this is an imperative statement, right? Keep yourselves in the love of God. What I, I've said imperative multiple times. I mean, this is a commandment. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't a, hey, if you find the time, keep yourself in the love of God. If it's convenient. No, he's saying do this because this is a direct commandment from God himself. Jude writing from inspiration, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And they needed some help in that. Maybe there were some of them that Jude is writing to. They began to say, you know what, maybe these guys over here, maybe, you know, they seem to be really knowledgeable and they seem to be a little bit more enlightened in certain things than I am. Because that's the way those people thought of themselves, right? Those false teachers earlier on in this book, we saw that, that they thought of themselves highly. They thought themselves above the word of God. Jude would talk about that as we talked about last week. They thought that they had some more knowledge than what the word of God had. And maybe there were some that, were, that Jude was reading this letter, or rather writing this letter to, that began to think that, began to say maybe, Maybe they've got something that we're missing. And Jude's reminding them, no, they don't. They're empty. Remember how he says they're a whole lot like trees that you planted so that fruit can come forth, but then in the harvest they bring nothing. They're nothing but death. In other words, they're empty. They may seem like they produce good fruit, but they don't. Don't fall back to them. Don't go to them. Lean on your Lord and Savior because he's the truth. That's why earlier on in our first point in verse 17 through 18, he told them, he's like, remember what the apostles taught you in Jesus Christ because that's the source. You got to weed everything else out and go back to the word, right? You want to know why there's so much confusion today? Uh, you know, I remember... Uh, Somebody asking the question, and you've heard it, why are there so many denominations? I've had that question asked me so many times. Why is there so much confusion? And it's because they've allowed for all these things. Even, even those in the church have allowed for so many things to interfere. We've got to look past all that and go back to this book, amen? This has to be the foundation because this is the source of life. This is everything. This is what we need to get through this world and to go on to that life of everlasting living. We'll look at what he says here. We continue on. He says, keep yourselves in the Lord. Once again, if we can't fall away, then why write this? Why say to them, keep yourselves in the Lord? Why tell them, earnestly contend for the faith? Why tell them, beware, if there's no possibility that an individual could ever fall away from the Lord? Because he doesn't want to lose them. God doesn't want to lose them. God sees their souls as precious. You think God loves the false teacher as well? Absolutely. But unfortunately, that individual has given themselves up. God still wants them to come back. 
But Jude's saying, look, don't you who are still here, don't you go down the same path that they did. He says, keep yourselves. He's going to list several things. Keep yourselves in the love of God, the love of God. He who does not know love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. One of my favorite passages of scripture, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, that God has demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us continue steadfastly in that love. Isn't that what Paul told the Colossians, or excuse me, the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4? Reminding them, look, look past all that false doctrine. He's telling them that. He's like, look, there are going to be people that are going to come to you with every wave of doctrine. So, but you keep focusing on the love of God. He even told them, teach the truth and how? In love. The very thing that's the foundation of everything. Why does the church exist? Why is it this book is here for us to live by? Because God is love. Because God is God. See, he's telling them, keep in that Stay in that. Stay in God's love. He says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Paul would say to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, right? That he gave, that he, that he, he made us alive together with Christ Jesus. Being rich, abounding in mercy. The greatest act of mercy. Jesus Christ coming to earth to redeem us so that you and I do not have to, remember the wages of sin is death, so we don't have to pay that price. And he's coming again to bring those who remained in him home. Oh, that's going to be an awesome day, is it not? Talk about a great act of mercy. That on a day that all of humanity should be judged, all of humanity should be cast into hell, that Jesus has made a way that there are those that if they choose to follow him while there is still time, can on that day hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me tell you, none of us are worthy of that. And yet it's because of God's mercy and God's love that that's made available. We keep reading. And he says, he says this, he says, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That leads to eternal life. And then he says in verse 22, he says, and have mercy. Now I want us to understand, now he's saying something else. He's saying, look, you, you guys have been anticipating, you're living proof of his mercy. He says, and you're going to continue to see how God's mercy is going to abound in your life, especially when he comes again, right? We're talking about a great, I mean, we know of salvation, but man, imagine that day knowing that if we followed him, imagine Noah sitting in that ark, realizing, man, thank God for his great mercy on those who follow him, on those who obey him. So imagine how we're going to be on that day because of God's great mercy. So now he says, here's how you should live. He says this in this verse. He says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Literally put yourself in their shoes. That's what the Greek almost implies. It gives this implication, put yourself in their stead. Have empathy for them. Have mercy on those who doubt, on those who may be struggling, on those who may be wavering. In other words, be kind and compassionate and help them. Encourage them to see the things that you now know, the things that you now learn. We need each other, right? Why do you think the, the majority of the New Testament is written to keep the church focused? Because there were many who were growing discouraged. The Hebrews writer is writing his entire letter to a group of people who are eventually, if, uh, the Hebrews writer is inspired by God and he's writing that letter because these people, they are on the path. They're on the verge of leaving Christianity altogether. And the Hebrews writer all throughout that book is reminding them, no, don't go back to Judaism because Jesus is better. Tells them, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, right? See, that's what our job is, encouraging one another, building each other up helping each other so that way we can all hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're called to do. See, these false teachers, you know what they did? They tore people down. You think they built people up? No. The foundation on which they rested on, they made every effort to pull those people off of that foundation. They made every effort to uproot people from the foundation of Jesus Christ and plant them where there is no life. They took them out from the Word and put them in a place where there's only death and decay. But that's not what we're to do with one another. We're to encourage each other. We're to build each other up. We're to edify one another, right? We do that through the word. We do that through song. 
Let me tell you, if there's a song, one song that encourages me, uh, see, Stephen sang a song tonight, Anywhere is Home. That I love that song. It's super encouraging. Another song that I love, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. I love, uh, you know, I think about when Cody left here. We sang that song, right? It was the last song that he got to sing with us in worship. Blessed be the tie that binds. Why? Because it's encouraging to know that if we continue faithfully, we're going to see each other again. You think about all those other ways we've encouraged each other. Ladies Bible class does a good job of that, building one another up, helping each other to grow in their, in their card giving, in their praying with one another. You think about when we meet together on the first day of the week. We're striving to help each other get to heaven because there are some people who you don't know what is going on in their life that may cause them to waver. And we've got to be understanding because it could happen to me too. But we don't allow it to happen, right? We've got to be understanding about where those people are, but we've got to do everything possible to help encourage those people to have that hope, right? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, right? Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's where my hope is built upon. And we've got to encourage everyone else to have that same hope. Again, there are some people who may be wavering in that. James tells us that we can't be double-minded. But we've got to help each other to fix our eyes on Jesus. We've got to help that. We've got to help one another do that. He says not only this. He says not only to have mercy on those who doubt. He says, but also save others by snatching them out of the fire. It's like rescuing them from a burning building. Notice the urgency in his tone. Saving others. That's what we do when we teach the gospel. That's what we do when we remind each other of the gospel. Why was Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 going through the gospel again with people who already obeyed it? Because they forgot it and they needed to be reminded. He wanted to remind them that the resurrection was true. The letters of 2nd and 1st, or excuse me, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written to encourage the church at Thessalonica, a church that was being persecuted heavily in that city, to remind them that there was something greater. There was something more because we need to be reminded of that. If we care about people, we're going to do the best we can to snatch them away from the fire as well, right? Those that are in the world. Notice the urgency in that tone. If we love people, we did a class this morning on evangelism, right? See, all the souls, on, as I said it this morning, all the souls on this side of heaven ought to be concerned of all the sinners on this side of hell. In other words, those of us that are bound for heaven, those of us who are striving, we ought to be concerned for those who can't say that that's their destination. Who Jesus Christ looks at and says, that's not your destination because you're not following me. We ought to be concerned for those people. And with urgency, we ought to do everything we can to reach them and help them out from that fire, right? We keep reading. And he says, he says, have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by sin. See, we've got to be encouraging one another and encouraging what Judah's doing is he's encouraging them to be rooted in godliness. Godliness entails being rooted and grounded in his love and his mercy and his compassion in that urgency and doing the best we can to keep ourselves and spot it from the world and helping others to do the same. Oh man, do you hate sin? You know, we're told in Revelate, or excuse me, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, to abhor that which is evil. You know what the word abhor means? It means to be absolutely disgusted by it. And if you are truly disgusted by sin, you are going to do everything you can to ensure that false teaching is being thwarted. You're going to do everything you can to ensure that the people in your life, they hear the gospel because you hate sin so much and you love them so much that you want to see them go to heaven. Amen? That's what we're called to do. See, Jude is reminding them of their role. That's what we all need to be reminded of from time to time because it's very easy to think that Christianity is just limited to a one day a week event. It's very easy to think that Christianity is not only limited to that, but it's also limited to Wednesday nights. Christianity ought to permeate our entire being. Amen? Amen? Christianity ought to be about everything we do. Christianity ought to be about the manner of living according to Jesus. So when we think about what exactly, excuse me, this is kind of awkward. Let me go ahead and hand this off. <laughs> when we think exactly about what Jesus instructs us to do, you know, throughout the scriptures, and as he committed to the apostles to teach others as well, man, we've got a responsibility not only to each other and not only to this world, to live godly and to help others come to see him, to see his love, to know who he is. People are not going to know who Jesus is if we don't display that love, right? 
We've got to be displaying that love. We've got to be displaying the truth. People aren't going to know. Think about all these other people out here who say they have Jesus' love, but they don't have the truth. So what are we going to do? We've got to hold to the word. We've got to teach the truth in love. We've got to cling to that pattern. We've got to preach the word and be instant in season and out of season. We've got to reprove. We've got to rebuke. We've got to exhort in all longsuffering and teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 1 through 2. Let me tell you, there are so many souls who want to hear the truth. And let it be the people that teach them. Those same people are those who are clinging to it with everything they've got. Those same people are lovers of the truth. Those same people, Christians, are those who have embraced the truth with everything they have and will not endure false doctrine, but only will stand by what's true. If you're here this evening, my encouragement to you, I hope that that's your encouragement to me as well, is let's keep pressing on. Let's keep helping each other. Let's keep encouraging one another to stick to the word of God, just like the way Jude is teaching them. Let's keep on glorifying God in a manner that's pleasing to him and helping others do the same. If you're here this evening and if you're not a Christian, there's only one way to him. There's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. Paul told Ananias, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Why do you wait? Because again, those who live the life of falsehood are those who have rejected the truth. And you don't have to just be standing in the pulpit and teaching false doctrine to be living a life of falsehood. We realize that, right? The rejection of truth meaning a lifestyle that's not obeying God. Remember, when he comes again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9 says, He's coming again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and on them who did not obey the gospel. So we have to, we have to look at ourselves and say, have I obeyed the gospel? And if you have not, we encourage you to come forward as together we stand and as we sing.